Thank you, Angelica, for giving this presentation today. And thank you for all the attendees who, for logging in. So actually, it's, it's actually unnecessary to introduce Angelica at all here, because I think everyone in the, uh, in the audience is knowing her. So uh, if, if just for, for those who don't know Angelica, Angelica is running a core facility for biomedical engineering. She, she is also running a, a research group in the University of Ulm. And uh, this is not, uh, I, actually there are many people are doing such things, but the, the, actually what is special for Angelica is, she is one of, the f of our very first TCSPC FLIM users. And she is one, uh, one of those who recognized very early that autofluorescence FLIM and especially the uh, FLIM of NADH and FAD, it gives us a huge amount of information about the metabolism of cells and tissue. And so actually this is from my point of view, and I think Angelica will uh, agree with me, this is actually the future of this technique because there is a little point to uh, just to, to get, get microscopy images from, from one specimen and another and for different fluorophores. What we should do is we should actually develop the technique in a way that we can actually can that, that we can investigate the reason and the biological background of diseases and as Angelica says bio and energetic alterations so just this is just the future and I think the talk of Angelica will go in this direction the title is NADH FAD FNM FLIM and oxygen blim plim Plim, sorry, PLIM means pl uh, phosphorescence lifetime imaging to monitor bioenergetic alterations. So Angelica, we are excited to hear your talk and I will hand over. Yeah, please start Angelica. Okay, now I can start. Yeah, first of all, dear friends, dear colleagues, Dear people, I would like to thank very much uh, Hauke Studier, Wolfgang Becker uh, for inviting me to this exciting webinar. It's really very interesting for me to speak with a computer instead of being in a big audience. But uh, I hope I can convince you that NIDH, FID, FM and FLIM is a very interesting approach. And during my talk, I will discuss the basics of the technique and methods, even for those who are beginners in metabolic flim. But I will also focus on advanced algorithms, which are important for novel diagnostic approaches. Now in metabolic flim, we have to deal with so-called metabolic coenzymes, which play a role in metabolic flim. And these are mainly coenzymes from NIDH or NIDPH, the nicotine amid adenine denucleotide, or also the coenzyme coming from the FMN and FID group. The NIDPH is excited at 360 nanometer. It's fluorescent at 460 nanometer if unbound to proteins, and it's fluorescent at 440 nanometer if bound to proteins. The important thing is that NIDH is fluorescent only in the reduced state. And the fluorescence quantum yield is quite different from unbound and bound, protein bound NIDH. Now for the flavin group, we have to deal with two different flavines. First of all, the flavin adenine denucleotide, which possess two chromophores, the isoaloxacine ring and the adenine ring. Whereas the FMN here uh, marked in green, the flavin mononucleotide possess only the isoaloxacine ring. Both molecules are excited at 450 nanometer and they fluoresce exactly at the same wavelengths. Thus the fluorescence characteristics from the spectral point of view are the same. But the fluorescence quantum yield is quite different now uh, the FMN uh, has a factor of 10 more uh, in fluorescence quantum yield. Important is also that in case of FID and FMN, the oxidized 
form is fluorescing. So this is in contrast to NIDH, and this is quite important for the further discussion. Now, the role of metabolic enzymes in energy metabolism is shown here. There are two main reactions uh, how a cell can gain energy, ATP. And this is, first of all, the anaerobic glycolysis. In that case, NIDH is produced in a so-called free state. So NIDH is free. We speak about a reduced cell and anaerobic metabolism and NIDH in a free state. Whereas the second most important part is oxidative phosphorylation with this mitochondrial membrane. In that case, NIDH is oxidized to NID+. NID, NIDH is bound to proteins in this aerobic metabolism because oxygen plays an important role. Therefore, it's an aerobic metabolism. Cells are getting oxidized. The role of FMN and FID, of course, they also play an important role in, com for example, in complex uh, one and complex two of the respiratory chain. But the role is a little bit more complex and I will discuss this later on in more detail. In uh, metabolic flim, we have to deal with so-called fluorescence lifetimes. And therefore, I have to discuss in more detail what is a fluorescence lifetime. And we, and we can uh, explain this when, uh, when observing the different excited states by the so-called Jablonski diagram. That's when a molecule gets excited from the crown state, crown singlet state, to the first excited singlet state. Uh, the decaying process, it's, it's able to fluoresce to go the, to the crown state. It can uh, go to the crown state via radi radi radiation-less uh, decay, the internal conversion, or it can underwent a spin flip via intersystem crossing to go to the first excited triplet state. There can be also energy transfer to an acceptor molecule. Now, in fluorescence lifetime imaging, the lifetime in the excited state, which we name fluorescence lifetime now, is the reciprocal of all the rate constants which are possible from this first excited singlet state, fluorescence, intersystem crossing, energy transfer, and internal conversion. And with this fluorescence lifetime, we can observe metabolic coenzymes, we can observe metabolic switches and changes during treatment, which we will see later on because intersystem crossing is possible to this triplet state, state, some molecules are even able to phosphoresce, to emit via phosphorescence. Now this phosphorescence takes much longer because it's a spin forbidden process. And the phosphorescence lifetime, again, is the reciprocal of all rate constants, that's the phosphorescence rate, plus a quenching rate. And this quenching rate is a quite interesting parameter because the most abundant quencher in nature is oxygen. And therefore, from this phosphorescence lifetime, it's possible to determine oxygen concentration. I will discuss several so-called phosphors to determine or to observe the oxygen levels in cells, but also some photosensitizers in photodynamic therapy I will discuss later on. Uh, can show oxygen consumption via the phosphorescence lifetime during photodynamic therapy. Now, just uh, to summarize, in glycolysis, the anaerobic process, we have to deal with free NIDH. The free NIDH is, uh, is an interesting molecule because it possesses a short fluorescence lifetime. Uh, the lifetime is around uh, 0.4 nanoseconds or 400 picoseconds. Whereas in oxidative phosphorylation, we have to deal with bound NIDH. And this bound NIDH possess a much longer fluorescence lifetime at around 2.5 nanoseconds. Now, when oxidative phosphorylation decreases, this means we have more reduced metabolism, a reduced cell glycolysis increases. Free NIDH is increasing during glycolysis, thus the lifetime of NIDH is getting short. Whereas when glycolysis decreases, the cell is getting oxidized. Oxidative phosphorylation is increasing, NIDH 
bound NIDH is increasing and the lifetime of NIDH is getting long. So in fact, what we always measure is always a mixture between free and bound NIDH. Thus, by inspecting or by calculating the fluorescence lifetime, we always have to deal with the so-called mean fluorescence lifetime, which is a mixture between the short fluorescence lifetime and the long fluorescence lifetime and the appropriate weighting factors, so-called amplitudes, A1 and A2. Now, what happens with FID? This I would like to discuss later on. It's always a question if FID and also FMN, if they are bound or not bound when oxidative phosphorylation is increasing or decreasing. The last molecule, which is quite important in the last step of the respiratory chain is of course oxygen. This is an aerobic process. In this last step, oxygen is reduced to water. And what a nice idea to have a method to observe this oxygen, to observe this oxygen consumption. And uh, we will see it later on. Phosphorescence lifetime imaging is a nice technique to observe oxygen and also oxygen consumption. In metabolic film, it's always a question if the redox state, which is an important parameter, and energy metabolism are really correlating. Now, what means the redox state of a cell? The redox state of a cell is defined by the redox ratio, which in fact is the ratio between reduced NIDH and oxidized NIDH, thus the NID plus. But because of NID plus is not fluorescing, Approximately, yes, in 79, so 41 years ago, Britain Chance, he defined the so-called optical redox ratio, replacing the not fluorescing NID plus by the fluorescing FID plus. That's from this we can def define and calculate the so-called redox ratio. Now, when the cells get reduced, we have a, red, a, a redox state which is re reduced. The redox ratio is getting high, and because there is a lot of NIDH, the fluorescence of NIDH is also high, <clears throat> and the lifetime of NIDH is getting short. The energy metabolism is glycolysis, whereas the opposite is true. Oxidized cells are correlated with an oxidized redox state. The redox ratio is low, the fluorescence of NIDH is low, and the lifetime of NIDH is getting long. And we, when we speak about oxidative phosphorylation is the energy metabolic state of the cell. But however, there's a big question. Is there always correlation between what we call the redox state of a cell and energy metabolism? And we can say, no, it's, this is not true that we always can correlate these two parameters. The correlation Correlation is valid only if the NIDH, NID plus pool is stable. Then the fluorescence intensity, the lifetime, and the redox state correlate. This is also because uh, NID plus, the oxidized NID, can be metabolized in many different reactions in the cells. Thus, this means be very con uh, careful when comparing different cell systems concerning the redox state. It's much better to observe the lifetime, but this is only an indicator for cell metabolism. This was also discussed by many other authors in, in, in published in different, in different papers. So what is much better to use uh, instead of the redox state, it's much better to use the so-called NIDH redox index. What is the NIDH redox index, it means a so-called delta tau, a delta of the lifetime <clears throat> between, uh, on a scale between, fully between a fully oxidized cell system, fully oxidized, for example, when the cell is fully oxidized, thus uh, the, uh, the mitochondrial membrane, uh, the, the mitochondrial membrane is uh, decoupled, for example, by FCCP or between or a fully reduced state, state 100% fully reduced conditions. We can fully reduce a cell by inhibiting the mitochondrial membrane, for example, with antimycin A. However, this is a problem. We cannot fully oxidize and fully reduce our system in, in vivo. So this is not possible. It's just possible in cellular models. 
But what I want to say, a longer lifetime, when we observe a longer lifetime, this does not automatically mean a higher oxidized, oxidized state. It just means a different cell metabolism. <clears throat> because of these difficulties, uh, we need better algorithms to determine energy metabolism in in vivo systems. Just to remind you, the optical redox ratio defined by Britain Chance, defined by the fluorescence intensity of NIDH and FID. And the optical redox, is, this is the optical redox ratio. And uh, some years ago, Amasi Periyasami and his group, they defined a very nice redox ratio, which is called the FLIR-based redox ratio in comparison to the intensity-based redox ratio. And this FLIR-based redox ratio now is defined as the amount of bound NIDH divided by the amount of bound FID. I have to discuss that it's very interesting. Bound NIDH has a long fluorescence lifetime. Therefore, we have this quantity, this uh, compound A2. Bound FID, in contrast, has a very short fluorescence lifetime. Therefore, we have to calculate here the A1. In both cases, but I will discuss this in more detail later on, a B exponential fitting both of NIDH and also FID is required. This means that as more oxidized a cell is, as higher is the FLIR index because bound NIDH is increasing. The question is what happens with bound FID? The OMA index is another very interesting algorithm which was introduced by uh, Alex Walsh and Melissa Scala. And it's in fact a, a mixture between the intensity-based redox ratio and the FLIM-based redox ratio. This is the intensity normalized redox ratio and the mean lifetimes of NIDH and mean lifetimes of FID. Another very interesting uh, index uh, which I name the NIDH metabolic index, not to confuse with the NIDH redox index, which I defined one slide before. Thus, the NIDH metabolic in index on a flim based in a flim based manner relates free NIDH with a short fluorescence lifetime to bound NIDH with a long fluorescence lifetime. Of course, also in this case. B exponential fitting of the fluorescence lifetime is required. There are lots of examples for advanced metabolic flim in the literature. Now concerning the OMI index, which I defined one slide before, uh, Melissa Scala and her co-workers were able even to measure drug response in breast cancer xenografts by introducing or by, by taking different drugs. And they could see that these xenografts responded very well when the OMI index went down. The FLIR index, which was introduced by Amasi Periyasami and his group, could show that, for example, during doxorubicin induced uh, apoptosis, in different cells that during this induction, oxidative phosphorylation was increasing. And this was related with an increase of this FLIR index, which means an increase of bound NIDH and maybe a decrease of bound FID. In fact, the FLIR index increased. A, another different approach, which I would like to mention, which I not mentioned yet, is the so-called phaser approach, where the decaying compounds are represented in something what we call a phaser. And this was introduced by Chiara Stringari and in, in Enrico Cratone in a very famous work. And with this phaser approach, uh, the group could even show during circadian oscillations in the mouse skin in a living mice, that the uh, metabolic, that there was a metabolic change during the circadian oscillations. Advanced metabolic flim is also uh, done uh, in Ulm, and this was this work was done in a, in a, in a very good collaboration with the neuro, neurological department of the University of Ulm, Patrick Schäfer. Um, uh, Christine von Arnim, Björn von Einem. And what we did here, 
uh, we, we observed, first of all, neurons, primary neur neurons, which were not treated and which were treated with antimycin A. Thus, uh, the mitochondrial membrane was inhibited, or they were decoupled with FCCP, the mitochondrial membrane was uncoupled. And what we observed was a switch in the fluorescence lifetime here represented in co false colors. So this is a normal, a normal uh, lifetime. This is a, a a very nice shortening of the fluorescence lifetime. You can see it goes more to the red to shorter lifetimes. And when uncoupling with FCCP, the lifetime is getting much longer. Now, it's also very interesting to study neurological disorders by fluorescence lifetime imaging. And uh, for this, uh, we used normal hex cells, which were not treated with anything. And you see here the fluorescence lifetime inside a single inside the mitochondria of the cell represented again in false colors. Now green means a mean lifetime, uh, red means a sh very short lifetime, and blue means a long lifetime. Now when the cells were not treated, we have the normal conditions and normal mitochondria. These are all living cells, I have to stress, and these are only false colors. So no staining, nothing, just autofluorescence. Now, when these hex cells were overexpressed with APP, uh, which is a transmembrane protein in the mitochondrial membrane, which upon cleavage gives rise to A beta, A beta, which, uh, which goes to the complex one of the respiratory chain, of the inner respiratory chain, and inhibits the respiratory chain reaction we could nicely see a switch towards different to another uh, metabolism. Thus, the fluorescence lifetime was getting much shorter of NIDH. Whereas when, uh, in addition, this cell was, uh, was transfected with a secretase inhibitor, with an inhibitor for this cleavage process, we got again normal conditions. Patrick Schäfer, in a nice work, he also sh has shown that, in fact, we have also to correct the NIDH lifetime uh, for the pH, which can change in the mitochondrial matrix during uh, metabolic changes. Um, I also would like to, <clears throat> like to discuss the NIDH metabolic index which I defined as uh, the relation of unbound NIDH divided by bound uh, NIDH. In a, in a very nice work by, uh, by uh, Hauke Studier and co-workers, these people could show that here in a non-invasive uh, melanoma uh, progression model, uh, they could show that in, a, in the skin, where a tumor was uh, growing underneath the skin. Here the, is the normal ear skin of the of a mice, and here is the tumor is the tumor development. That in the skin overlaying this tumor, that the uh, that cell metabolism ch was changing. So this relation a one divided by a two was changing, and it was interestingly changing that a one was increasing tumor during tumor development. And what is also quite interesting with this uh, metabolic index is that in the normal skin, A1 was approximately between 70 and 75%, whereas when the tumor was growing, A1 was between 82 and 86%. That's the, the difference is around 10%, and this 10% difference is enough to, uh, to correlate uh, a switch in, in cell metabolism. This was also observed by other people. I just would like to mention uh, Marina Shirmanova from Nizhny Novgorod. She had a very nice article in, in Nature, and she also could show that uh, an increased oxidative phosphorylation was correlated with less A1s. That's with, a, with, a low, with lowering of this ratio. So far, uh, the role what plays NIDH during cell metabolism. But the main part of my talk will deal with FID and FMN. And FID and FMN, as I mentioned, also play an important role in bioenergetics and in cell metabolism. Now, uh, in FMN, it's known that it functions in complex one of the respiratory chain. 
And this means, so in complex one, so this means when NIDH is oxidized to NID plus, FMN is reduced. Therefore, glycolysis means that A1 of NIDH is increasing. So there is no further oxidation of to NID plus. NIDH is no longer functioning in the mitochondrial membrane. This also means there is no further reduction of FMN plus. This could mean that bound FMN plus is increasing during glycolysis. And because bound FMN plus possess a long fluorescence lifetime, as you will see later on, the lifetime can change due to, uh, due to FMN. FID, we also, of course, have to think about FID, the other very important flavine molecule in the flavine complex. Uh, is functioning in complex two of the respiratory chain, mainly functioning in complex two of the respiratory chain. And it's always a question if uh, the FID plus increases or decreases during glycolysis uh, or during oxidative phosphorylation. Just to show you, during Parkinson's disease, this was a nice work by Chakraborty, uh, he followed that uh, the reduction of FID to FIDH2 was inhibited. And he also followed that bound FID was increasing. He followed that during glycolysis, bound FID is increasing and that the opposite is true during oxidative phosphorylation. We will see now what people found, what other people found. Because of this uh, complexity of the FID FMN complex, there's also always a controversial discussion about the FLIR index and what does FID FMN FLIM means for cell metabolism. Just to uh, give you an example, um, Melissa Scala and her group, they could observe that in the tumors that the lifetime of FID was increasing during tumor development, <clears throat> which means uh, when the lifetime is, uh, of, of FID is increasing, <clears throat> this means that, uh, that, the, uh, that the bound, uh, that the bound uh, FID was decreasing. We observed, uh, we, we, we compared two different cell systems, uh, a tumor cell, in that case SEC cells stands for squamous carcinoma cells, human uh, tumor cell, we compared with the carotinocyte, also with the human carotinocyte cell, a HACAT cell. And what we found was that in the tumor cell, first of all, the lifetime of NIDH was getting shorter because of more glycolysis. By the way, this is called the Warburg effect. In many tumors, it's observed that cell metabolism changes towards glycolysis. And we can also observe this that the lifetime is getting shorter in the tumor cells. Whereas in the HACAT cell, the lifetime of NIDH is getting longer. Now, what happens with FID? In case of FID, you can see it also here in our keratinocytes, we have a long fluorescence lifetime. Whereas in our cancerous cells, we also have a short fluorescence lifetime, a shorter fluorescence lifetime of FID. And these observations are completely consistent with which was defined as the FLIR index. But other people observe opposite, opposite uh, values and which is not really consistent with the FLIR index. But we have to know that in some cases we also observe negative Warburg effects. Also, and that's what I want to discuss now, we have also to, to deal with FMN. Um, when dealing with FMN, we have to think about the quantitative flavine contents of in different mammal mammalian cell lines. And there is a, a list of different mammalian cell lines. I have this from the literature. And you can see here, of course, the content of FMN is less than the content of FID. However, we have to think about that the fluorescence quantum yield of FMN is a factor of 10 compared to FID. So this compensates in many cases the, what we see as fluorescence in microscopy. So we have, to, we have to think about FMN. Now I would like to come to our own experiments to advance NIDH, FID, FMN, FLIM, and our experimental conditions, how we are doing this. I will discuss two cell uh, types, uh, as I mentioned, human carotinocytes and humans 
squamous carcinoma cells. What we are doing is we have a conventional laser scanning microscope. Uh, and for, for advanced metabolic flim, we have to use a short pulsed laser to excite the fluorescence. In that case, we are using a femtosecond pulsed titanium sapphire laser for two photon excitation, which we also use as a short pulsed excitation source. Uh, the fluorescence lifetime is detected in a two-channel TCSPC. TCSPC stands for Time Correlated Single Photon Counting. In a two-channel TCSPC system, uh, which consists on two high bright detectors, thus, to, uh, thus to, to allow simultaneous detection in two different spectral channels, for example, FID and NIDH simultaneously or other dyes. The electronics, the TCSPC electronics was very, very well explained in a webinar before by Wolfgang Becker. So I would like to advise you to see, to go back to this webinar because it would be too much if I discuss this here again. But what I want to uh, say, for two photon excitation, we are using the following wavelengths for excitations. For, FI, for NIDH, we use wavelengths between 740 and 780 nanometer for excitation. So this is two photon. For FID, FMN, we are using 880 nanometer for two photon excitation. We detect within two spectral regions with the two uh, type right detectors. And for NIDH, we are yet using a channel around 432 nanometers. And for FID, FMN, we are using 530 plus minus 20 nanometers. So we are pretty sure that with this excitation and detection conditions, we can nicely separate FID from NIDH. Now we tested different fitting procedures. And when we uh, and after I have to I have to uh, explain that after excitation with a short pulse laser, we are detecting the fluorescence intensity decay, and we have to fit this intensity decay to an exponential curve, a decay curve, to get the fluorescence lifetimes. So this is an uh, example for a multi-exponential multi decay. But in case of NIDH, what we are doing, we are normally uh, doing a so-called B exponential decay fitting, which gives us the lifetime and the amplitudes of free NIDH, the short lifetime, and the lifetime and amplitude of bound NIDH with a long lifetime. In case of our FID FMN complex, we found because it is a very complicated complex, we found that it is best to do a three exponential fitting, where we got for the bound FID for the short lifetime and uh, the amplitude for the short lifetime, this relates to bound FID. We also got the, uh, the, the middle lifetime, which correlates to free FID with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the uh, amplitude of free FID. And also we can calculate uh, a very long lifetime, normally around six, between five and six nanoseconds. And this lifetime correlates uh, to FMN uh, with the appropriate uh, amplitude. Now, what we are normally doing, we tested different fitting procedures and what, what was the best fitting was, uh, the best fitting for NIDH was when we fixed the lifetime tau one and tau two to 400 picoseconds and 250 picoseconds. Then we got the best fitting result for A1 and A2. For the flavins, we also tested different fitting procedures. And the best fitting was done when we, when we had a free fitting. And what we got with a free fitting, we got a short lifetime around 0.3 nanoseconds which relates to bound FID, a, li a, a middle lifetime between 1.7 and 1.9 nanoseconds, which relates to free FID, and a very long lifetime, as I mentioned, uh, between 4.5 and 5 nanoseconds or 6 nanoseconds, which relates to FMN. And this is bound FMN because it's very interesting. Free FMN has the same lifetime as free FID, more or less. 
Now we did uh, several cal different calculations uh, for FID, FMN and FLIM in our cell system in the SEC uh, cells versus the HACAT cells with different fitting procedures with free fitting, with fixed fittings. And what we observed was in every, for every fit for the FID, FMN complex, the lifetime, the mean lifetime was significantly different for the HACAT cells and it was always longer for every fitting procedure. Um, which means A1, the uh, bound FID was decreasing in the HACAT cells, whereas bound FMN was increasing in the HACAT cells. And the, uh, the results were, were always uh, statistically significant. So we have, we also calculated the statistical uh, significance. So we correlate that bound FID decreases in our HACAT cells and a bound FMN increases in our HACAT cells, which correlates to increased oxidative phosphorylation. Now we did something else. We calculated the relative fluorescence intensities of our different compounds of bound FID, of free FID, and of bound FMN, because we wanted to know from, from which fluorescence comes the most signal. And interestingly, when we calculated these Q values, which give us the relative fluorescence intensities, when we calculated these Q values, the highest amount of fluorescence comes from FMN in our, in our, uh, in our microscopic image. This does not auto automatically mean that FMN has the highest uh, uh, quantity, but it gives rise to the highest fluorescence quantum yield, what we can see here. And there was also a significant difference, especially for, uh, for this fluorescence intensity in the FMN channel. Now, uh, we, we defined different FLIR values. So the classical FLIR values defined by Amasi Pariasami is the FLIR values, which means bound NIDH divided by bound FID. But because we are doing a three exponential fitting procedure, we can also define FLIR 2 and FLIR 3, which is bound NIDH divided by free FID and bound NIDH divided by uh, bound FMN. And interestingly, we compared all these different FLIR indices during the different fitting procedures with the very important NIDH metabolic index, which is just bound NIDH divided by, uh, sorry, free NIDH divided by bound NIDH. And what we observed when, when, when calculating the significance of our result, here you can see the p-values, that the, most, the statistically most significant value was reached for the FLIR1 index, which correlates to the classical FLIR index defined by Amasi Periasami. So for, th for this index, we just got the highest significance. Now we wanted to see if we can see the same, uh, the same observations in co-cultures. So we did some uh, co-culturing experiments of our SEC4 and HACAT cells. We can see here keratinocytes and SEC cells. And we did, we, uh, we, we, uh, we did some masking around the cells and calculated the fluorescence lifetime in the co-culture. Thus we fitted, we did a fitting procedure inside the masked areas. And what we get, got was very interesting. Again, uh, we calculated tau mean of NIDH and tau mean of FID in these co-cultures in SCC4 and HACAT cells. And interestingly, only for NIDH, the mean lifetime was significantly different, but not for FID. So tau mean of FID of NIDH is significantly different in the co-cultures. Tau mean is not different. And, but what is also significantly different and most different is the FLIR1 index, which correlates to the classical FLIR index defined by Amasi. And this is the most significant also in co-cultures and this corresponds to monocultures. And this is quite important because this is a more realistic uh, uh, point of view. Co-cultures are more closer to uh, real in vivo conditions. So 
So this was the first part of my talk. I hope I have some more minutes to discuss also a little bit about uh, phosphorescence lifetime imaging, because this is also a very interesting approach. I just discussed only about fluorescence lifetime imaging, but in the second part of my talk, I would like to talk about OMOXI. OMOXI, which means optical metabolic imaging and oxygen imaging by simultaneous flim plim uh, techniques or measurements. And I want to speak about phosphorescence lifetime imaging and how to measure oxygen because we have seen oxygen is quite important. Now oxygen concentration can be determined by the, from the phosphorescence lifetime when, when calculating the so-called Sternvolmer equation. So we can see here's a, a linear, a reciprocal linear relation between oxygen concentration and the phosphorescence lifetime of a probe. Now, good phosphors, P, uh, molecules who are, are good, have a good phosphorescence are complexes with central transition metal ions from subgroups with slower unoccupied or single occupied orbitals. Just to say some examples, these are normally metals, metals from the platinum group from the 8 to 10 subgroup. In the, in the periodic system. So as ruthenium, palladium, uh, uh, platinum, but also iridium. What happens? All these, all these uh, molecules, all these complexes give rise to a metal ligand charge transfer state, uh, which upon intersystem crossing goes to the triplet metal ligand charge transfer state. And this, triplet metal like charge transfer state is emittive and it gives rise to what we say phosphorescence with a long phosphorescence lifetime. I will show you some examples. And this was done in collaboration with uh, my good friend Lothar Lilge from, uh, from Canada, from the University of Toronto and with a company Terralize also in Canada. Uh, we we uh, wanted to see if TLD1433, this is a photosensitizer which is able to phosphoresce because it has a ruthenium in oxidation state to a central atom, a complicated molecule as you can see here with different aromatic subgroups. It has a nice uh, phosphorescence and we can measure phosphorescence lifetime from this probe. We did this in our microscope and now you see microscopic images uh, and we did this, we, we changed oxygen concentration in the incubation chamber of our microscope. So we have here 21% oxygen concentration. When we observed the phosphorescence lifetime, you see it here in false colors. And then we, we induced hypoxic conditions. So 1% oxygen in the incubation chamber. And what we observed was a dramatically increase so a significant increase in the phosphorescence lifetime of our cells because oxygen concentration was very low and the phosphorescence lifetime was very nicely increasing. So the photochemistry of this TLD is quite complex and as I mentioned, it is a photosensitizer. So we just have to think about, of course, we have to think about this triplet charge transfer state, which gives rise to the phosphorescence by uh, emission and, and uh, decaying to the ground state of, of, the ML, of, of this TLD. But because it's a complicated molecule, uh, this uh, TLD also possesses different other triplet states, for example, an intraligand triplet state or a metal-centered triplet state. And all these triplet states uh, give rise to oxygen dependent or oxygen independent so-called photodynamic reactions, very interestingly. And because oxygen is consumed during such a reaction, we, we can observe by the phosphorescence lifetime of this molecule, oxygen consumption during photodynamic therapy, to, during photochemistry. And we were especially interested what happens when we do simultaneous NIDH flim and oxygen blim by TLD1433, we wanted to see if the met metabolism is changing when we incubate the cells with this TLD and when we do photodynamic therapy. And yes, metabolism is changing a lot. 
So here you can see the prelim image of the TLD and the blue color means that the phosphorescence lifetime is very long in the cells. So these are all single cells, <clears throat> living cells, by the way. And the blue color means a long phosphorescence lifetime and this means hypoxic area. So this means very low oxygen concentration. And what happens, we, can, we could correlate this quite nicely, pixel by pixel, that in these pixels, the lifetime of NIDH was getting very short. That's which means cell metabolism was changing. We can see this here, the lifetime of, uh, of NIDH was getting very low. This is without TLD, this is with TLD. Uh, thus, we could partly correlate the long lifetime of TLD with the short lifetime of NIDH and we could see, we could observe a switch in cell metabolism during photodynamic therapy. But we were also interested, thus I have to mention, this TLD is a light sensitive probe which induces light sensitive reactions, it's a photosensitizer. We also wanted to see what happens with so-called inert molecules, which do not change during light activation, which are not known as photosensitizers. Can we measure stable oxygen concentrations uh, with those probes? And for this, we, were, we used a different probe, an iridium complex. And this was done in collaboration with the university in St. Petersburg, um, Ilya Kritschenkov, he came to our institute, he came to our university, he comes from the institute, from the Chemical Institute of St. Petersburg and his boss is Professor Tunik and we got to have a very nice collaboration uh, with this group and they, uh, uh, they um, developed this called ASK1 complex and we incubated this ASK1 in our cells and what we observe with ASK1, uh, when, uh, when, uh, the f when oxygen uh, was normal, so we had a high oxygen concentration in our, incuba in our incubation chamber, uh, the phosphorescence lifetime was short, whereas when we induced hypoxy conditions, the phosphorescence lifetime was low, was very low, so comparable to what we observed for TLD. But now, interestingly, when we observed simultaneously NIDH flim during blim of ASK1 under normoxic and hypoxic conditions, we did not observe a change in the fluorescence lifetime of NIDH. And this reflects the stable molecules, molecule ASK1. Thus, ASK1 does not induce a phototoxic reaction. It's not a photosensitizer. We can just measure uh, the phosphorescence lifetime and the oxygen concentration inside the cells and our uh, cells uh, are staying very stable. This is very interesting. Now, I did not speak yet about the technique of simultaneous flim blim, but this was also explained very nicely by Wolfgang Becker, but just I want to mention it briefly. So we are doing this again in our laser scanning microscope here in an LSM 710 from CES, where we coupled short pulsed lasers. We are mainly using a MITI titanium sapphire laser with 80 megahertz repetition rate, which uh, has pulses in the femtosecond uh, range. We are doing two photon excitation. And how can we do simultaneous flim, flim detection? BLIM has a much longer lifetime. Phosphorescence lifetime is much longer than the fluorescence lifetime. Anyhow, we can do this simultaneously. We are doing this in a way that we modulate our laser, our titanium sapphire laser with an AOM. This means that during the on phase of the laser, we are measuring the, uh, the, sorry, the fluorescence lifetime of NIDH in the NIDH channel the phosphorescence of our phosphor is built up and during the so-called off phase of our laser, we are measuring the phosphorescent photons, the phosphorescence lifetime, it looks like here. So, and in the phosphorescence channel, we have to define a rectangular uh, into an uh, IRF, so instrumental response function. And from the curve, we can calculate the phosphorescence lifetime. So we are doing this really simultaneously in our, in, with our cells. The total, because I, I'm sure I, 
some people will ask how long we collect to measure simultaneously flim blim. The total collection time for such an observation are 60 seconds. So one frame is, uh, uh, is uh, scanned in seven, around seven, between seven and eight seconds. And we scan several times. So in total, we scan 60 seconds to get this image. Now I would like to come to my summary. I hope that I kept the time. I discussed in my talk, and I hope I could convince you, that functional imaging with time-resolved luminescence microscopy, especially FLIM and FLIM, is interesting to investigate cell metabolism, the redox state, and oxygen sensing in cell biology, in molecular medicine, and in diagnosis. In detail, I discussed cell metabolism, how to measure cell metabolism, how to measure redox ratio and the redox state, by NIDH, FLIM, by FID, and FMN FLIM using various algorithms. And I also discussed oxygen sensing and how to measure oxygen consumption by phosphorescence FLIM using different phosphorescent dyes. OMOXI, which is both, was, is, was discussed to be used as simultaneous flim-blim to analyze cell metabolism and oxygen. And, at, uh, at, and I would like to show you the images again of ISK1, where uh, the lifetime of NIDH did not change, and of this TLD, this photosensitizer, where the lifetime of NIDH also was changing during the process. And in my last slide, I would like to acknowledge people who have done all this work. So that's, of course, me. This is Svetlana Kalinina, my best co-worker. Uh, Kirsten Reis, she is responsible for all the cell cultures. And Nilanya Naskal, he did all these nice calculations. He's also helping me with all these IT techniques. And I hope that uh, my talk was functioning well. I would like to mention all my co collaborators, uh, the neurological department, Björn von Einem, Tim Eiseler from the internal medicine department at the University, Ulm Lothar Lilge from the University of Toronto, Ilya Krichenko from the University in St. Petersburg, Ronald Srocka, Christian Freimüller, Patrick Schäfer, for all these nice people. Without them, uh, we would not be able to, to do all this, all this work. And of course, I would like to mention the, fu the funding, most important funding of this OMOXI project. I would like to show you an image of Ulm and of the cathedral with the highest church tower in the world. By the way, my grandfather, my grand grandfather put the last stone on this tower and you can see here nicely the Alps in the winter time with the snow. So you have to come sometimes to Ulm. And now at last I would like to mention because there are many unpublished data in this talk, I cannot allow yet recording. However, you can ask me anytime questions. Here is my email again and I will answer your questions as well as I can and I will also send you some results. And I would like to thank you very much again, and I think we are open for discussion. <laughs>